Question this morning. Have you ever felt like, man, Lord, life just feels meaningless? Have you ever felt before, man, God, what is the purpose of life? I'm not trying to get morbid. I'm not trying to go off on the deep end this morning. Have you really just ever contemplated that before? God, what is the meaning of life? You know, I used to think about this uh, a lot when I was a, a kid. Uh, I'm a, a little bit of a nerd, so to say. I uh, had space magazines growing up, and we'd get them delivered to my house. This was before, obviously, before cell phones, and I would open up these space magazines because I was so fascinated with the universe and so fascinated with God's creation and the thought of, man, how big the universe really is just boggle my mind, still boggles my mind. I had a telescope and I would look at the stars. I'd go outside and, and gaze at the stars and I would just think, Lord, Lord, what is the purpose of life, even as just a young kid? And I would ask these questions and contemplate it and it's still something that, you know, we will often contemplate. Lord, what is the meaning of life? And this morning we're going to explore what Solomon says as the wisest man who ever walked the planet the things that will allow us to see what the meaning of life is. Solomon went on this journey to find out what the meaning of life really is. Let me tell you a little bit about Solomon. Uh, his father was King David. King David was a man after God's own heart. He loved God so, so much. And yet, his love for the Lord, he was still yet a big time sinner. He committed adultery with Bathsheba, and then he killed Bathsheba's husband to cover it up. And yes, that is very, 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 very bad. Murder is wrong. <laughs> Out of this relationship came Solomon. Solomon took over from David as king of Israel. And upon David's deathbed, he says to Solomon, Solomon, keep your eyes on God, keep your nose in the word, and obey his commandments. With this, as he took over the kingdom of Israel, um, God was extremely pleased with him. And because of God's pleasure with Solomon, he says, Solomon, you can have one desire, one wish, like Solomon, what do you want? And just think about that for a moment. If God asked you, you could have anything you wanted in this life, what would you you asked for. You know, I kind of thought about this, you know, if I'm really being real with myself, I'd say, Lord, I want some money. I want to be financially free for the rest of my life. That's what I desire. That's what I want. Some of you in this room might say, man, I want fame. I want fame. I want to be famous. I want a YouTube channel that has 100 million followers. And man, this is going to be the residual income type of thing. It's going to be amazing. Everybody's going to know about me. Lord, that's what I want. I want money. I want fame. Maybe for you it's just like, Lord, just give me the simplicity of just a big house and uh, a boat that's on the river and a nice car. And, man, I am satisfied, Lord. Lord, give me that. I don't know what it might be for you, but Solomon, in his wisdom, what did he ask for? Many of you know the story. What does he ask for? He asked for wisdom. And God is so pleased with the response that Solomon has to him. He says, not only am I going to give you wisdom, Solomon, but, man, I'm going to give you fame, I'm going to give you fortune, I'm going to give it all to you, Solomon. And so Solomon is pretty much, you know, uh, Elon Musk, he's got the money, he's like Brad Pitt, I don't know if he's, you know, like people say he's the best looking man on the face of the planet, and Albert Einstein, the smartest, you know, he's those three like wrapped all into one human being, like that is Solomon, and so with this wisdom that Solomon has, he goes on this journey to discover, man, what is the meaning of life? What is all of this? He writes three books of the Bible. He writes uh, Proverbs, the Song of Solomon, and he writes Ecclesiastes. And so as I said, Ecclesiastes is all about, man, what is the meaning of life? He gives himself everything that he could possibly ever want. Like, because he has the ability to do that, because he's king, because he has the money, he has the fame, 
He gives himself everything he possibly could ever want, trying to discover, trying to find what the meaning of life is and fulfillment in this life. And so let's look at uh, chapter 2 here. Chapter 2, verse 10. This is what it says. It says, I deny myself nothing my eyes desired. I refuse my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor. And this was a reward for my toil. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had told to achieve, everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind, nothing was gained under the sun. Solomon compares going after what this world has to offer to try to find fulfillment and meaning like chasing after the wind. How many of you know you can't chase after the wind? If you're chasing after the wind, you're never going to catch it. You will never catch the wind. You will never receive fulfillment from these things, Solomon says. Solomon writes this word 38 times in this book, vanity. In chapter 1, right off the bat, he says, vanity, vanity, everything is vanity. This word, going back to the Hebrew, is this word hevel. Hevel means a vapor, smoke. In other words, everything that you achieve in this life, it is all going to be like a vapor. It's all going to be smoke. You will see it for a moment and it will be gone. Hevel, hevel, everything is hevel. Everything is meaningless. It's all worthless. Everything we accomplish in this life that is not of God, that is not for his kingdom, whether we realize it or not, it is hevel. It's like smoke, vapor, meaningless. It's an encouraging word this morning, isn't it? (laughs) Everything is hevel. You see, no matter what you achieve in this life, no matter how much money you make, no matter how much fame you obtain, no matter how many likes, shares, followers on your social media accounts that you might get and you might have and you might desire, even love within our family relationships, Solomon is saying even that is hevel. Even that is hevel. We chase after comfortability in this life. It is the American dream that is a lie. And I'm here to tell you this morning, eventually what is going to happen is the Lord's going to bring a shaking upon this earth. And all that is going to happen is we're going to have this realization that everything is hevel. Everything is meaningless. And what really matters is God. And I don't know about you, but I am so excited for the moment that the church begins to awake and to realize that everything is meaningless except for God. Everything is hevel. No matter what we achieve in this life, nothing really matters except for Jesus, except for his kingdom and building for him. Everything. We can see right now the the birth pains of the Lord's return. And I believe, man, he is returning soon. When you look at everything, there is no denying it. And so we have to have and understand this urgency that the Lord wants to put inside of us, this heart. Instead of chasing after all these things, this world, this, this world and making everything this meaningless, all these secondary issues that we make primary issues and everything else, man, it's about God, it's about his kingdom, it's about the, the, the people of God being united in love and with spirit and taking this world by storm, with the power and the might of his spirit. That's what it's about. Everything is meaningless. Except for the kingdom of God. Solomon, with everything that he had, he went on this journey to discover it. I challenge you this morning, maybe go back. We don't have time to read the entire book. Spend this week and read the entire book. But this is the conclusion of this book, and this is where we're going to spend the remainder of our time. Ecclesiastes 12, 8 through 13. What does Solomon find on his journey for the purpose of life? This is what he says. This is his conclusion of this book. Verse 8, he says, everything is meaningless, says the teacher. Everything is meaningless, says the teacher, completely Meaningless. Keep this in mind, the teacher was considered wise and he taught the people everything he knew. 
He listened carefully to many proverbs, studying and classifying them. The teacher sought to find just the right words to express truths clearly. The words of the wise are like cattle prods, painful but helpful. (laughs) Sometimes we hear things and we read the word of God and it is painful to read, but it is necessary. The word of God, man, it is not about making you feel good. It's not about trying to find a way to prove your own point through the word of God. It is about taking his word at face value. Lord, what are you saying? What are you speaking? What do you want for your people? And taking that and applying it to your life. The words of the wise are like cattle prods, painful but helpful. Their collected sayings are like a nail-studded stick with which a shepherd drives the sheep. But my child... Let me give you some further advice. Be careful for writing books is endless and much study wears you out. Here's what I want to tell you this morning. Nobody has it figured out. Nobody has it figured out. I don't have it figured out. None of us has it figured out yet. And we need to study ourselves approved and go after the Lord as part of the process of learning and growing with the Lord But there has to be this place where we come and we realize, Lord, I am man and you are God. I am simply man and you are God. And he's going to work it all out, man. When we get to heaven one day, he's going to correct us so many times. He's going to show us, man, this is what this meant. This is what this meant. And it's going to be a beautiful, wonderful thing. We have to understand you can study and study and study. But, man, we're not going to figure it all out. That's why he's God and I'm man. The next part is where I want to spend the remainder of our time. Here's Solomon's findings when it comes to answering the question, what is the meaning of life? He says this in verse 13. That's the whole story. Here now is my final conclusion. Say this with me. Fear God. God. Read it with me. Fear God and obey his commandments for this is everyone's duty. God will judge us for everything we do including every secret thing, whether good or bad. Solomon's saying three things. Fear God. Obey his commandments. For there will be judgment. Because this is the secret to understanding the meaning and the purpose of life. Fear God, obey his commandments, for there will be judgment. So the first secret that I want to give you this morning to find meaningful life. If you're wondering, man, I just don't feel like I have any purpose. I don't feel like I have any meaning. I'm really struggling, God. Lord, what are you speaking to me? What are you saying? Here is the first way that you discover this meaning of life, this purpose of your life. First thing, fear God. Fear God. Fear God. You know, one of the biggest issues you see in the Bible is a fear of God. The Bible says in Psalm 11, 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? The beginning of wisdom. You know, there has been this um, old school trend in the church and this thinking that, man, that's, The fear of God, that's a kind of old school hellfire brimstone. Let's just leave that, go off to the side. It doesn't really matter. It's all about God's love, grace, and mercy. And I'm here to tell you this morning, man, I love God's grace, his mercy, his love for us. But if you really want to understand the length, the breadth, the width, the height, the depth of the love of God, right here in this psalm, it says the beginning, the beginning of wisdom is a fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is beginning of wisdom. If you really want to understand the length, the breadth, the height, the width, the depth of the love of God, you first have this, have this, have this revelation of this love, of this, this fear of the Lord. This revelation of the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If you want to discover who God really truly is, you've got to understand and have this revelation of the fear of the Lord. 
You know, there's, there, there's this, when peop, oftentimes when people uh, teach the fear of the Lord, they'll say, you know, the fear of the Lord is just this honor and respect. And when I look at the fear of the Lord in Scripture, though, I don't just see an honor and respect. I see an actual human emotion of, man, God, you are so big. God, you are so great. And this actual fear of the Lord, like this overwhelming feeling like, man, I am man and you are God. Like, God, you are so great. God, I am, I am nothing and Lord, you are everything. Like there's this revelation of the fear of the Lord. When Isaiah saw God, when Isaiah had this revelation of, of God, he says, woe is me for I am undone. Woe is me, I, I, am, I am sinful God. And Lord, I recognize I am nothing. And Lord, woe is me for I'm completely undone. John, in the book of, Revela book of Revelation, what happens, he has, he sees Jesus. And what does he do? He falls down on his face. And he has this really this honest, like um, human emotion of fear that comes over him. It's understanding how big and how great and how almighty that like nothing rivals God. And this is a problem. We try to make ourselves God. We try to say, man, I'm God. My life is my own, whether we realize it or not. And we say, man, I'm just living for myself. I'm going to live and I'm going to do these things that you know, I want to do, even though I know I'm not supposed to do it. And we don't have this revelation of who God really is. Because we have this revelation of who God really is, there's this fear of the Lord that overtakes us. Look at this in Isaiah. We're talking about this, Isaiah 44, 6 through 8. It says, I am the first and the last. This is God speaking. There is no other God who is like me. Like him, step forward and prove to you his power. Let him step forward and prove to you his power. Let him do what I have done since ancient times. When I established a people and explained its future. In other words, God is saying, man, is there anyone who can rival me? Is there anyone who can come against me? And he's realizing, he's saying, God is saying, there is nothing, and I know, this is how God talks about himself, there's nothing as big and great and mighty as me. He is the alpha, the omega, he is the beginning and the end, he is omnipresent, he is omniscient, he is all-knowing, all-powerful, this is the God in which we serve. And that is with the beauty of submission underneath this God. But to really truly submit to this God, you've got to first have the fear of the Lord, for the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But here's the beautiful thing about it. When you begin to understand the fear of the Lord, this is the beautiful and wonderful thing about the fear of the Lord. When you begin to have this revelation of who he really is and his might, his bigness, his goodness, and may really it be this ongoing thing where we recognize the fear of the Lord. What begins to happen is God says to his people, man, fear not. <laughs> that might sound like a, a contradicting statement right now. But when we understand, have this revelation of the fear of the Lord, then God comes to us, he says, listen, fear not. Fear not. Isaiah, woe is me, I'm completely undone. An angel comes, touch coal upon his lips, you are forgiven. You are forgiven, your sins are washed away. He's recognizing his sin, and the angel comes and says, woe is me. He's saying, woe is me, and then the angel comes and says, you are forgiven, you are forgiven, you are forgiven. John, what does he say? He bows down before the Lord, and he's shaking with fear. And Jesus says, fear not. He's told, fear not, fear not. Let me give you an example of this. My daughter Ruth. She is 13 years old. I want you to know, I value her. I cherish her. She's most, to me, she's the most beautiful, loving, wonderful person. Like when you meet her, her heart is just pure and good. And I love it. Like she is, like that's how much I value her. Like she is my treasure. She's my prize. And when that boy shows up one day, he better have the fear of the Lord inside of him for me. Like, I don't have a shotgun yet. 
But when he shows up at that door to take her out on that first date, I'm going to be there. And, man, I'm going to put the fear of God in that boy. And he's going to have fear all over him that's going to shake his boots. Like, I am going to protect her. I am there for her. And like, I am, boy, you better watch out right now. And I'm praying, man, she only dates one, one boy. And it's going to be when she's 25 years old. <laughs> Amen, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> but then, man, if he has the privilege of growing in this relationship with her, what ends up happening is I don't want him to come to me and have fear. I want it to be play, replaced with this love relationship because then, man, we are family. And he becomes my son-in-law and he's like my own. And I want him to recognize and to know, man, we, we're friends. You've had this fear. You've had the privilege of marrying Ruth, my treasure. And now we're family. And there's this love relationship, and I'm saying to him, fear not. <laughs> Don't be afraid of me. Fear not. We're family. <laughs> Listen, we're the bride of Christ. And what God is coming back for is a spotless bride. And what he is doing in the earth today is he is shaking the ground, and he is shaking uh, the, the, our, our, our hearts, and he's allowing us to experience what we're experiencing to move us back into this place where we have this fear of the Lord and to understand, man, he is everything because he is jealous for us and he wants to prepare us so that we are prepared for his son because we are his bride. You see the, the parallel there? He wants his church to have a holy fear because one day he's returning and he's coming back for a bride that is spotless. He's coming back for a bride who understands the meaning of life. Fear God. Number two this morning, obey his commandments. Obey his commandments. Let me ask you this question this morning. When we read God's word, do we take the word of God as suggestions or commands. We love to take it as suggestions, don't we? But do we take it as suggestions or commands? Jesus says this, if you love me, you'll obey me. If you love me, you'll obey me. Now, think about this progression here. God instills inside of you this revelation of the fear of the Lord. This fear of the Lord and this revelation of who he is, his bigness, his might, his goodness. And then this fear of God that grips you. What does it do then? It turns into this love of God. And this love of God allows you then to obey his commandments. How wonderful and beautiful is that? Because his fear is replaced with love, and he says, if you love me, you'll what? You'll obey me. If you love the Lord, you'll obey him. You know, about five years ago, uh, back I was uh, just, uh, I was driving, I was actually headed up to my parents' house, uh, or leave my parents, I can't remember if it's leaving or, uh, or coming or, or going uh, to my parents' house up in North Carolina, and I was by myself, and um, I don't remember why I was by myself, but I just remember having this encounter with the Lord, and this Lord really just speaking to me, he says, Adam, do you love me? And I just remember so vividly him just speaking in my heart, and said, Adam, do you love me with all your heart? And I said, Lord, you know that I love you with all my heart. And he goes, Adam, do you love me with all of your soul? I said, Lord, you know, you have my soul. He said, Adam, I don't really have all of your strength yet. Do you love me with all your heart, with all your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength? You see, we've got to make the choice, the decision, 
to be obedient to the Lord. Obedience really is better than sacrifice. That's what the word of God says. In other words, man, you can love God with all of your heart, with all of your soul. But if you don't love him with all of your strength and choose to do what is right. Choose to do what is right. Your worship is in vain. Obedience is better than sacrifice. You can dance before the Lord, you can raise your hands, you can speak in tongues, you can do all of these things, but all of it is vanity, vanity, unless you just choose, Lord, I obey you. Lord, help me to be obedient. This has been the age-old problem since Adam. This sinful nature coming in, and oftentimes our obedience is just a choice. It's not even a sinful thing. It's not even a sin matter. It's just, man, when God tells you to go minister to someone, to share the gospel with someone, okay, God, I'm going to be obedient right then and there. It's when God tells you, man, Adam, I want you to wake up early tomorrow morning and come spend time with me and make the choice and have the discipline to go do that, I'm obedient. Is it a salvation issue? No. I'm going to be obedient in that. When the Lord speaks, it's rapid obedience. It's quick obedience. Do we negotiate with the Lord? Or do we just say, yes, Lord, whatever you want? I think oftentimes we'd rather negotiate with God. When he speaks to us, you're like, oh, God, was that really you? Lord, did you really, you really want me to do this? Like, Lord, I don't really think so. Um, I, I, you know, that's a little too bold for me. I'm, I'm going to feel uncomfortable. Like, that's just, man, Lord, I'm I just going to sit here. I want to allow them to see me. And just be an example of the Holy Spirit for everyone around me. But I don't need to share the gospel. It's good. I'm good. <laughs> it's not God's heart, is it? We try to negotiate way too much. And say, oh, Lord, <laughs> you're coming back. And Lord, I understand your bigness and greatness. And I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to share the gospel with everyone, God, who does not know you. Because, Lord, point number three this morning, there will be judgment. There will be judgment. You might be saying this morning, Adam, I'm saved. I've given my life to Jesus. I don't got to worry. I'm going to heaven. But I want you to know this morning, there's two different judgments. You may have given your life to Jesus. You may have surrendered to him. You may have said, Adam, I'm not going to hell. Man, I applaud that and I celebrate that. And man, if you've never made that decision this morning, I challenge you this morning to make that decision here at the end because there will be judgment and hell is a real place and heaven is a real place and I want everyone to go to heaven. The Lord wishes that no one would perish but everyone would have everlasting life. It's not his desire for you to go to hell but and his holiness and his goodness and his love and in his grace. It's important for everyone to make that decision. We gotta know there will be judgment. But this, let's read this, Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes 12, 14. This is the judgment it's talking about. It's not talking about the great white throne judgment, which would determine heaven and hell. It's talking about the judgment seat of Christ. Watch, for God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. You see, there is going to be judgment, not just for us to go to heaven. If you made that decision, you won't be at the great white throne judgment, but you will be at the judgment seat of Christ. And you will be judged by what you do for him, how you are obedient, and what you don't do. Look at this, 2 Corinthians 5.10. For we must all, say all. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That each, could you say each? That each one may receive the things done. In other words, the things in which you do here on the earth, in this body in which we live. Each one will receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. 
So when I'm coming to the conclusion of the book of Ecclesiastes here, what I've been saying is that, man, we are going to be judged by what we do and what we don't do. It's not a salvation issue. I've said this around here a good bit that belief determines where you'll spend eternity, but behavior determines how you'll spend eternity. I don't have a lot of time to kind of go deep into this. I've spoken on this in the past, and I've done a deeper dive into this. You can go online and find some of those messages or that, that message, but what I do know is this, that, man, we are going to stand before, the, before God one day, and we're going to be judged by what we do and what we don't do, and everything that we do on this earth that is meaningless, it will be, as the Bible says, all burnt up. Man, when I stand and I see the Lord and in the power of his goodness and the power of his might and I see for who he really is, man, yeah, I'm going, I'm going to be kneeling down before the Lord and I'm going to say, man, God, you're judging me based upon what I've done and what I haven't done. And Lord, I know where I want to study myself approved. I want to do, God, what you're calling me to do. Lord, help me be obedient. You see, it under, we have to understand that it starts with having a fear of the Lord in the season right now while we are on this earth. And if we can have the fear of the Lord, we then will have this revelation of his true love, of his true grace, of his true mercy. And as we have this revelation of his love, his goodness, his grace, and his mercy because of fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, then we go into this place of, Lord, I love you, and I just want to obey your commandments, God. Lord, would you use me? Everything in this life I realize is meaningless. It's all, everything under the sun is meaningless, God. Lord, nothing matters except for just you. Nothing matters except for following after you, of going after you, of, Lord, doing what you're calling me to do. Lord, I pray that that God, you would change my perspective. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I told you at the beginning of this message that, man, I, I felt like I would, had this, uh, I need to recalibrate my perspective. I had, four or five weeks ago, just this hunger and this desire just for money and everything this world has to offer. And I was just saying, God, like, why is this here? Like, Lord, help my heart. Like, what is going on? It's distracting me from everything, God, that you want me to do and what you're calling me to do for your kingdom. And he said, open the book of Ecclesiastes. Open the book of Ecclesiastes. So as I dove in, the Lord's began to take those desires and that heart place that I knew wasn't of him. He began to change my perspective. And I was like, Lord, there's nothing wrong with wanting to provide. There's nothing wrong with that. But oftentimes, man, if we're real with ourselves, it can be this chasing after the wind. We're trying to catch it. Lord, I'm chasing after it. I'm trying to catch it. And it's just this fleeting thing where it's like, when is enough enough, you know? When is enough enough? Where is that line? I don't know about you, but oftentimes we're just chasing after more, 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 whatever it might be in your life. I want more, I want more, I want more. And more is not enough. More is never enough. Solomon's saying, vanity, vanity, everything is vanity. But to really understand the meaning of life, fear God. Obey his commandments for there will be judgment. So this is my challenge to you this morning. Would you rise and would you stand with me?